first of all, yeah, thanks for the presentation. I, I really like the the last three slides, like how do you the, the summary slides, like the what is the result and what is the discussion and what is your recommendation? Yeah, it's, it's very good. And so now with the discussion session, like I would like to start with this question. Like you, you, in your thesis, you focus on oil spill risk. And yes. what are the like the major cause of this oil spills that happening? Because uh, like uh, like based on what I read from your thesis, it was mentioned that it could be from oil drilling in the offshore drilling in the sea, and then there could be uh, oil spilling from the ships, which which carries something um, to the coast to the people, and and also. That you also explain there's an accident between two ships and that is to them oil spills. Are these the causes for the oil spills or do we have anything else? Uh, yes, so these are the um, causes that I I concentrated in my thesis. So yes, the offshore oil drilling and uh, um, traffic, maritime traffic. Uh, but in my thesis, I, I mean, I focused on accidental oil spill risks, but of course there are, or in addition to that, there is also kind of routine uh, or operational oil spills, uh, especially when it comes to offshore oil drilling, uh, <clears throat> where, mm, where oil is actually, <laughs> uh, or there is, uh, there are kind of more, or these kind of operational oil spills are actually more common and um, common and taking place. Um, yeah, with that they are connected to the <laughs> the operational to the activity, so that yeah, that there is actually oil sp oil spilling to the sea all the time, <laughs> but. Uh, uh -huh. But uh, as a result of these operations, but, uh, but then, uh, and also there are of course other environmental uh, risks. Uh, the for with the drilling operations, there there is this something called the drilling mud, which also I'm not quite familiar with, but it's uh, related to the to how the operation is carried and how they have to insert water into the to the uh, when they are drilling for oil and they have to 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 get the oil they have to inject water into the to the ground and that creates these kind of drilling muds which can be also uh, dangerous for the environment uh, these kind of risks but yeah in so what i mean in the in this study, I, I I only looked at these kind of accidental oil spill risks from from shipping and uh, oil production. But uh, do you mean if there are some other activities that could result in oil spill? No, I, I just want to be clear. Like, what's the context on which yes. your study has been like based on? So you, you mainly focus on this accidental oil spills on maritime yes. traffic and then oil drilling. Yes, okay. and in, the, in these two areas, so the Norwegian Barents Sea and the Baltic Sea. Mm -hmm. But of course, um, there hasn't, in the Baltic Sea, for example, there haven't, there hasn't been that kind of, or at least uh, recently, there hasn't been that kind of uh, large scale oil spills happening. And also in the Norwegian Barents Sea, this has not been the case yet, but of course there are many historic accident cases all over the world where this it has already happened and with very severe consequences and long long term long term consequences. Yeah. So yeah. So could you uh, like maybe give an example on like or like who who are the people who has been affected historically by one of these. Uh, oil spill accidents and what is the environmental consequence of this one? Could you just to have this like a, in an easy way to understand? Who, who are the people who were affected? You mean? Uh, yeah, who are the people and what are the environmental 
risk that being caused yeah. by this? Uh, well, I guess the most famous example would, of course, be the. Uh, <laughs> no, I, in 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 uh, in the Gulf of Mexico, this. Uh, oh no, I deep sea deep water horizon accident. Oh, mm -hmm. Is it? Now I forget the. <laughs> of Sorry, course. Okay. Yes, but uh, which happened in 2010, I think, which was. The largest oil spill in, in the history of US. So mm -hmm. it was in the US coastline. And of course, this had many environmental impacts, uh, especially to fish, fishing industry, so mm -hmm. and, and also tourism because it uh, uh, it uh, the oil reached the shorelines. So these kind of impacts uh, can be very um, devastating for all the communities. Uh, that uh, yeah, especially since there are these kind of long-term uh, and compensating for those risks or for those events can be very challenging and, and long processes. So even though there are these, uh, first there are the impacts and which can destroy a, a fishing industry or a tourism industry, but then if you consider that you can get some kind of compensation for this, then it can take a very long time and it's difficult to compensate for all the damage. So there are these economic impacts also. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, that's in, that's the, that's a one case. And then of course, if it takes place, uh, for example, I've also, been looking at oil spills in Canadian, in the Canadian Arctic. And there, of course, it's a bit different in the way that there are these local communities that are highly dependent on the on the on on the marine resources, on, on fish and other species. And this kind of uh, oil spills, they would destroy the whole livelihoods and they are also closely more closely connected to their culture, so it could have very, yeah, a severe impact on their mm -hmm. way of living, their culture. Um, mm, yes. Yeah, I think that's that's that like two examples are actually enough, and it's, it's good. Like, so the the thing is like, um, since this this are accident, right? So this all still are accident. So. Uh, like uh, how effectively can this be modeled? Like in your first uh, research question, you, you actually try to review the existing risk models and how they, they could be effectively done, right? So so what did you find? Like because this accidents and how it's effectively this can be predicted. For example, how, how, how could we know like there's an accident between two cargo ships but, or like there's an accident of oil spill while offshore drilling, so how, how this could all this thing could be effectively predicted? So right. Uh, yes. Um, so in my in my thesis, what I try to highlight is that it's big, that the, there are many methods to predict those accidents and and the risk of an oil spill and kind of mm, the, the occurrence of oil spill and where it goes and, and what are the impacts and both environmental, social and economic impacts. But uh, this is highly, highly challenging, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, especially in the Baltic where this kind of, or where there, or in areas where this kind of accident has not already taken place because there's no historical data then it's highly challenging also to predict how it would affect or have an impact. And then there are these probabilistic approaches that I talk about, the Bayesian networks, that I provide a literature review in the first paper, or that I focus on in the first paper. But even those, uh, even though they are kind of considered to be, uh, mm, or I mean they are better suited to to analyzing or assessing these complex risks because they they provide this probabilistic approach and are better suited to modeling 
uncertain uncertainty because of this probability distributions that they that they use but even there it's kind of mm, in, in, based on my kind of uh, studies it's it's a uh, it's uh, highly challenging to quantify quantify these risks and then what i suggested instead instead of trying to only quantify these risks and then act based on that it would be also useful to to have these qualitative influence diagram uh, models that help to kind of um, uh, that help to assess how different stakeholders understand the risks and the impacts and then that would provide a basis for debate on the on the aims of risk governance as well as the appropriate solutions mm, and this might be more helpful when it comes to this this kind of mm, models that allow for debate and conversation and discussion on the risks might be more helpful when it comes to complex risks that are highly uncertain and where these are there are these high or the interdependent, yeah, that are highly complex because quantifying the risks might not be uh, possible, <laughs> and and it's kind of, um, yeah, um, yeah we, so for a long so time. It's basically like a participatory process, like where we give importance to the different stakeholders' work will be affected by the risk, and then to yes. make a decision involving them yeah so so which means like uh, how this like do you think like like you researchers like you and the experts in, in your field like you have this recommendation and then there are like government people from the government and how this uh like knowledge transfer happen like the recommendation to actually action like would they come and uh, have a contact with the researchers while making the policy decision like how the researchers or the scientists like you who are making all this research questions and recommendations how, how this things are get will be transferred into a policy action in the government agency like how you and the government uh, agencies interact or like work together would you give um, like an overview how this happens usually yes <laughs> that's uh that's a very good question because of course it's very again it's a very complex process that there is a lot of research on this like how to transfer the policy to action and it's a very complicated topic <laughs> and uh, yes but uh, yes one way what i discuss in my thesis or in my work is that they yeah that they should be part of this modeling process already uh, already from the beginning so throughout the process uh, and this would help them to understand uh, or it, it would help all the stakeholders involved to understand the risks better or to gain this kind of uh, comprehensive picture of the risks but also, so that's that would be one way. So models or involving the stakeholders in modeling could help. But then, of course, there are other type of kind of and this, yeah. And the, but also there are maybe like some kind of workshops that you can uh, uh, you can organize together with policymakers, experts, and other stakeholders, which can help to help the the different actors to uh, to gain a better understanding of risks risks as well so that's something i'm i'm working on in my postdoc when it comes to urban okay. or climate so, sorry to interrupt like, so this so like i want to know like how this is actually happening now like for example you said like the workshop thing where you have organized a workshop including like researchers and then people from the government so that they could be a knowledge transfer of the discussion but how it was actually happening now like how the the people in the government are actually making decisions or like the policies how it is happening currently how it is happening currently yeah like how 
yeah. how how they how they uh, frame like, the policies. Uh, how they consider how they take into consideration science in their in the decision making at the exactly. current when mm -hmm. it comes to oil spill risks or oh, like in general or in oil spill risks. in general oh, yeah yeah like how how they actually take into all the scientific knowledge into their decision making process do they actually discuss with the experts or the researchers in in each field and then take the decision or how they do have they have like a scientific advisor who recommends that these are the things that we could do like how it usually happens like how the politicians or the policy makers usually incorporate all the scientific knowledge yeah scientific. so well i mean of course they are um, well, I think so. What they when how they do it is, or how well how I have understood it is that the, the when they are preparing for new plans, or when they are making decisions, or when they are making the government program, for example, um, that's that's when they kind of have a. That's that's when they um, use like different scientific outputs to to prepare for these plans, and uh, that can come from kind of they can organize um, science scientists to present their results or 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 then they have scientific reports that they use to to make these to these plans, but otherwise uh, kind of and that, that's one of the things that I've understood is that that's the most important time to to try to to try to affect their decisions. So really, in the when they are making these plans in the beginning, because after that these goals or targets that are based or that are set in these plans, they are they are already set, and then it's very difficult to start to try to uh, to. To, to make them change the direction or to to present new knowledge mm -hmm. because then it's already kind of too late so that's one of the problems when it comes to trying to uh, use knowledge for decision making because uh, there are very specific time windows in a way where you can affect the decision making or bring in new knowledge mm -hmm. and after that it's more difficult to to try to yeah mm -hmm. so yeah. but otherwise i mean that's something that i should study more <laughs> and and uh, or that yeah that there is more research needed on like how do they actually use it but when it uh, uh for, in my study in my paper when i looked at how these oil spill risk models are used by decision makers i mean they were mostly unaware of these models and they what they were aware of was they currently used operational models that are developed by the uh the finnish environmental agency so the uh, research body or institute uh so not by university so that's one problem like there is a lot of research done by the environment and the agency, but also by the university. But maybe the university studies are not so well integrated into decision making as the normal agency. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I mean, I think that the knowledge produced by universities should also be kind of mm -hmm. better integrated or taken mm -hmm. into account. Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's like I think in your third research question you actually explored like how to use this Bayesian network models to actually integrate like a different domains like the scientific domain and the policy domain to help in making better decisions. So mm -hmm. I think you explored that that thing also like using the models. So do it like. 
again this again this comes back again to the second question like now you have a proposal or you have a research study then this again needs to be in, like given the light for the politician to see like there's something this kind of solution exists and this can also be integrated so so that was my like question like even though there are many proposals from the researchers or the scientists like it's difficult to uh, give this uh, like the light for the uh, given this like the publicity so that the, the politicians can uh, recognize that this solution exists so the, i want just i was curious to know how this gap could be filled up yeah yeah okay yes in the third in the paper three i also talk about these kind of four models of how uh, mm, science and policy interacts which i found mm -hmm. quite interesting the the first kind of mm, approach is this linear approach where we where scientists produce knowledge but then it's not used by the policymakers because it's not considered relevant or and they're kind of the mm, the recommendation is to kind of uh, to provide um, timely and uh, legitimate knowledge in a very like concise and clear matter manner and well communicated manner. So of course that's that's important. But then the other approach, so there were four. So the second one is the kind of that's also kind of problematic. It's when the state or yes the decision makers they they uh, they directly request for certain type of knowledge to be to be produced and this can of course lead in very kind of predetermined uh, approaches and knowledge and then uh, then there is the fourth one or the third one which refers to how these like policy and science can be considered as very separate entities or autonomous entities and there there is no kind of exchange between the two and then the fourth one that i talk about in my thesis is the corporate option approach so again participatory modeling and this is a bit different from the the first which is the linear uptake where you with where you focus on uh, better communication and providing information in timely manner and so on and so on it's a and this co-production refers to kind of more more profound change in, in how policy or science is produced because when you, you again when you involve the policy makers already from the beginning and also the other stakeholders then uh, kind of the the solutions that you come up with are less maybe I wouldn't say less practical, but they are more focused on these kind of root causes, or that's what the hypothesis is that they are more focused on root causes of these risks rather than these kind of very managed techno manage techno managerial <laughs> solutions to environmental problems. And that would be maybe more beneficial when it comes to transformations or sustainability transformations that we actually focus on, on the root causes rather than kind of small fixes. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So, so again, like on the fourth study, you actually like recommended like a proposal that you could integrate from science and the policy. But how, how do you think it, it would be if you also make people uh, more informed about all this risk and all these activities so that people could also uh, because people elect politicians so people could have a direct impact on the policies that politicians can make yeah uh, i i do agree that like information is important and uh, good communication about these risks is important but at the same time and that like like we need more science and we need better communication about it and and uh, mm, we need to think of new ways of how to communicate that's effective but at the same time there are mm, or what i'm more interested is in how like 
overcome the, the kind of different political power uh, or these kind of power relations that that uh, that uh, might despite effective communication there are these power relations that that we that will uh, not allow for changes in policies so not only about communication but we should also consider like who has the power in when it comes to decision making and uh, how that power is used and how it could be changed like uh, mm -hmm. how uh, yeah how what are the power relations that are involved in the decision making process and mm -hmm. how those could be changed in the way that we can allow for um, other for kind of more equal decision making mm -hmm. where they are not that kind of dominative uh, or dominating actors that get to decide what we are focusing on and who get to say that economic growth is the more most important thing and and uh, that's all that we care the about marginalized communities, like we don't need to care about the marginalized i mean just like like you said like in the canada there are like fishing Communities yes. Coast, or, yeah. Exactly. yeah. So how? Yeah. yeah so kind of marginalized voices could also be mm -hmm. better in, involved in the decision making process. Yeah, that's that's important. Yes. Yeah, so so uh, yeah. So yeah. So I think I don't have any other questions actually uh, on the presentation. But I'd like to know more about your current research like because you said like you're also uh now working on this climate risk in the urban en environment like how they, they could be effectively governed so you're mainly focusing on like the Helsinki region or um yes so it's this long risk project um where there are there is Helsinki University and Tampere University and then the Ah, what is it in English? The meteor meteorological organization, the Finnish meteorological or meteorology, okay. And um, mm, this is on yeah on climate change risks in urban environments, and it's on Helsinki, Tampere, and Kotka. And mm, I will wow. be most focusing on Kotka and how um, yes, how the experts there, how they see the climate change risk and how they would affect their kind of domains so also culture or uh, uh, education or business or the different kind of domains in the governance and uh, yes and how and then what we are doing is organizing workshops for those experts where they get to discuss together uh, the risks and the most important risks and how what are kind of new or alternative ways to manage or assess the risks and then there is a second workshop that will be organized uh, with the experts as well as the decision makers where the experts can uh, uh, kind of uh, where the experts present their results to the decision makers and then they again discuss like what could be done um, so that i think that's a very interesting study and it's nice because in my thesis i didn't actually get to or i didn't have the chance to organize these kind of workshops and now it's very nice to nice to get to be part of yeah. this kind of work yeah that's good mm -hmm. so you also will be making public or like the people who will be affected like because the climate change that you are going to organize will also impact people so so yes so this project doesn't focus on uh, it only we only look at the experts and the and mm -hmm. the decision makers oh, yeah. but definitely mm -hmm. in the future i mean it was already when this project was put together the focus was on the experts and the decision makers only so but in the future i would definitely want to organize workshops on also with with more like with the mm -hmm. civil society and ngos and local communities and especially i would like to work or continue to work on the like marine marine risks also so that's mm -hmm. interesting mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah nice. mm -hmm. yeah yeah so all the best for the research yeah so this like yeah all these are like, essentially needed for us 
Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thanks, Julie, for your presentation and for the discussion session. I uh, hope this uh, information that we that has been presented by you will be useful for people to help make informed decisions in their lives and also to enforce necessary policies so that everyone can live in harmony. Yeah, so thanks again for your com uh, coming and thanks for your efforts and time. Yes, thank yeah, you. So all the best for your future endeavors. Yeah.